Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. In today's show, I'm very pleased to be joined by Robin Jones. Robin is a widely published and highly respected investigative journalist who specialises in heritage transportation and industrial archaeology subjects. Recently, he's been raising the profile of a threatened, disused 19th century railway bridge in the town of Bourne in England, known as Bridge 234, which we'll talk about later, as well as contributing news and feature materials on a regular basis across a wide range of railway titles. He has written many books on Britain's railway history, and he's currently the editor of Heritage Railway magazine. Hello and welcome to the show, Robin. Hello. How's it been going? It's always very hard work, especially in lockdown. Um, you know, you might think news is actually short um, on the heritage railway scene, but it's not. It's very vibrant with people getting on behind um, projects and, and closed doors and under social distancing procedures. There's a lot happening out there that you don't see. Is there really? Yeah. And how, how's, how's the work been in lockdown? Have you just been just as busy? Yes, no, no, no less up at all. The, the magazine still has to be filled with meaningful stories, uh, features and pictures. And, um, you know, that has not been the problem, very surprisingly. I mean, obviously, when the uh, Heritage Railways stop running during lockdown, you think, well, that's an end to your supply of pictures and news. Yeah. Not so. There's always something else happening. OK. Right. So, so before we talk about Bridge 234 and the campaign to save it. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please, Robin, your life's journey and how you decided to become an investigative journalist and an author? Well, but basically, um, you know, I come from um, Solihull Hill in the West Midlands originally, and I got into journalism basically because I followed the non-league football team, Highgate United, yeah. who uh, were very big in the area in the... Um, in the 1970s, they got to the semi-final of the FA Amateur Cup, as was, and they won many trophies. And um, it inspired me to collect scrapbooks about them. And then when the came, time came, I started writing stories myself, and um, I became a, a correspondent for the club. Yeah. And I got known in, in weekly papers. And that led to me having um, becoming a trainee journalist um, on a weekly newspaper group. And... I progressed to the Birmingham Evening Mail, which is a daily, one of the biggest selling dailies of its type, and, and um, progressed to the news desk and also became an investigative journalist um, at the time. And um, from there, basically, about tw- 22 years ago, uh, there was um, an offer to take over the editorship of a railway magazine. Oh, yeah. And I thought, well, I know a bit about railways. I was an enthusiast as a young person. Yeah. And, uh, but the, um, the the remuneration package on the company car was far better than what I was being paid on, you know, for a very busy news desk job. So I took the job and moved to Lincolnshire. Sounds good. And you've been in Lincolnshire ever since, have you, Robin? Yeah, I've been in Lincolnshire ever since in the village of Baston, which um, I, lo- I, uh, I love to bits. I know it well. So how did you become interested in railways? When I was about four or five, my brother used to... My brother's eight years older than me. Yeah. He used to take me train spotting at um, Whitney Manor Station on the railway between Birmingham, Snow Hill and Leamington. And every, you know, the school summer holidays, um, you know... Um, you know, I think that was one of the few pastimes children or your schoolboys in those days had. You either went bird nesting or you went um, collecting jam jar aquariums with frogs and newts or you went train spotting. And if you were lucky enough to live near an airport, you were, you went plane spotting. Well, I was just about to say that, Robin. I, I lived in Windsor, which isn't far from Heathrow, and, and one of the things to, to do was to go plane spotting. In fact, I remember seeing the first Pan Am 747 coming in. Uh, and we were allowed out of class onto, onto the school playing field to have a, yeah. have a walk. Brilliant. So, uh, but basically, um, you know, I sort of got involved as a youngster into my, my, making model railways. And, you know, during the school holidays, my dad would take me um, to some of the uh, preserved railways that were starting up. And, you know, all well and good. I enjoyed all that. But obviously, as you get an older teenager, you you know, that all goes by the by and you get into other things your interests um, change yeah rock music and whatever yeah you know but um, obviously uh, many years later when the um 
offer a, a job opportunity came up. Um, then obviously I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, write, I'll write and see um, what they've got to offer. And the, the package was so good, it would have been silly not to have turned it down. Yeah. So you're mix, mixing the, the, the hobby of, of train spotting along with your career as an investigator. Well, it was journalist. a hobby as a teenager. I think yeah. I'm more of a newsman than yeah. um, a railway enthusiast. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I just enjoy collecting news, spotting news stories. And um, I like anything about heritage, whether it's railways, old canals, stately homes, castles. I'm interested in the whole scenario. Your, your interest in railways um, is very interesting. Um, I know we haven't got time to talk a lot about railways in depth but are you able to give listeners a brief history of the british railways and the major events that have sort of led up to the present day well obviously um it goes back to um i think about 1801 when a guy called richard trevithick developed um, um a steam road locomotive that um tried he tried it out going up a hill in camborne in cornwall yeah. and it scared everybody to death um, <laughs> it was possibly the fir- world's first effective motor car but in those days we didn't have time academy or um we'd forgotten how to build uh, roads since the romans went home uh, many centuries before so this um huge heavy machine sunk into all the possible roads or lanes of the day so we thought well plan b why don't we look at the old railways you know that um the horse-drawn railways used to carry coal and iron ore from mines to the nearest harbour and the port. Yeah. He thought, well, he took his machine and he put it on steel wheels. And in 1802 in Colbrookdale, um, he um, invented, I think, the world's first railway engine. And then he gave a public demonstration, one in 1804. Um, but it didn't take off overnight. Um, it was another quarter of a century before... Um, you know, people decided to admit that steam locomotives were better than horses yeah. for pulling trains. And it was only though in 18, 1829 the um, Rainhill trials were held to decide which was the best form of traction for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which was the world's first intercity line. And, you know, the poor old horse was knocked out at an early stage. Um, and um, Stevenson's Rocket won. And that basically was a blueprint for all steam locomotives um, development in Britain, at least, um, mm. forevermore, the basic concept. I didn't realise that the actual railway was, was already in existence, but, but for horses. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there, there were horse-drawn railways since um, Roman times, um, you know, like in... Um, in, in ancient Greece, the, the Corinth Canal, you had yeah. groove tracks, you know, to pull to haul wagons from one 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 um, port to another. You know, where it was too um, too difficult to build a canal between them. It, it's not a new concept, you know. In fact, where it has been dated back, the idea of a railway comes from Greek drama. You know, where. Um, yeah, you know, st- stage props were fixed on wheels, yeah. and they could be they they were halls on grooves in oh, okay. the uh, in the stage floor yeah. to move from one to the other. And I think that was the first world's first ever use of a railway concept. Yeah. Um, you know, centuries BC. So the steam railway was first put into action in Britain. Is that right? Yes, um, the world's first public steam railway was. Um, the Stockton and Darlington, which um, was opened in 1825, uh, 1825 yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There, there, were, there were one or two, you know, the decade before, there were one or two industrial concerns, particularly in the northeast, where steam locomotives had been invented and were used on short uh, railways connecting mines and collieries to the sea. And... Really, that came about not because of um, Richard Trevithick's invention in 1802. Um, Richard Trevithick died in poverty. He didn't make any, a single penny from railways. Oh, right. But, but um, what happened? The Napoleonic Wars changed the pattern. Um, so many horses were needed for the uh, British Army to fight the Napoleonic Wars. You know, the mine owners started looking around and thinking, hang on, how are we going to pull our, our, our wagons laden with coal and iron ore to uh, the local ports? Yeah. What can we do? We can't have teams of men pulling it. They're all in the army fighting abroad and we've got no horses left. 
hang on, that Cornish man, you know, we all wrote off a few years ago. What, you know, could he, could we have a look at what he, he um, builds? Look at his design for this steam engine. It sounds weird and wonderful, but um, we, as needs must. And yeah. that's when, the, you know, the Stevensons of the world and the um, Hackworths, you know, the, the big inventors of the day started looking afresh at the concept and yeah. um, developing an effective steam locomotive. So that, that was the sort of catalyst that, that created the, the new impetus to develop steam travel. Yes, that was. Yeah. And um, obviously, um, after um, the love of Liverpool and Manchester in 1830, no, well, few people looked at horses yeah. as a serious form of um, traction and everybody looked for steam locomotives. It's amazing. Now I know we could we could talk on and on about the history of the railways, and and um, we're fast forwarding now to the present day. And something I noticed was what looked like a Banksy type of graffiti or art. I don't know how you would call it. Um, and and the story behind Bridge Two Three Four. Could you just tell us a brief bit about the story behind Bridge Two Three Four, which is in Bourne in Lincolnshire, England, please? Yeah, basically the. Um Midland the Great Northern Railway built a line from um, Saxby in the East Midlands through Bourne and then Spalding uh, and then Kings Lynn onto Norfolk, basically connecting the East Midlands to um, the East Coast. Yeah. Um, um, it, the, the Midland the Great Northern was a system within the National Railway Network. Um, obviously, um, a couple of years before Beeching was even appointed, I mean, Beeching is synonymous with closures. British Rail, as it was, had started closing loss-making country lines. Yeah. And people thought, well, OK, yeah, we've got the motor car, we've got the lorry, we've got the bus. Um, not many people are using those. But 1959, a whole section, a whole, of, of, um, a whole system within British Railways, the Midlands and Great Northern System, was by and large closed. And that sent shockwaves to the railway industry People are thinking, well, hang on, we've seen the country lines you know, weren't used close. We can understand that. But this is a whole system that's gone. Yeah. Um, at the time, Bourne, I think, was still a four-way junction. You know, you could go from east to west and also you could come from Essendine up to Bourne and then from Bourne up to Sleaford and then on to Lincoln. Yeah. And, um, you know, the... the um, the closure of that, basically, uh, to passengers in 1959, um, basically um, rendered um, born in isolation from the rail network. We fast forward to today, then. We see, I, I see the um, the Banksy type of um, artwork on there. Why why is there a story? And what, what is the story behind trying to save this bridge? And can you just tell us a little bit about the bridge itself, please? Well... Bourne itself was was a a four-way railway junction which contributed very greatly to the prosperity of the town in Victorian and Edwardian times and also in effect today as a knock-on effect. Most of, you know, the the, uh, ticket office at Bourne Station was an Elizabethan mansion, um, the the Red House, which is still there. That predated the railway. But following the closure of the um, railway, most of the structures were um, demolished, even in the early 21st century. So, you know, uh, things were wiped away, almost as if the railway had never existed in Bourne. Really? And yet it was part of its history. Now, Bridge 234 was um, a, a road over bridge for a country lane or a farm track. Yeah. And um, yeah, that really is the, the sole surviving worthwhile artifact from Bourne's railway days. Now, um, it's, a, it's hidden in a sort of overground field at the uh, northern edge of the Elsie Park, the modern housing estate. And the developers want to knock it down to create a play area for kids yeah. and um, to build more houses to the north of it. You know, I can understand we need homes, but this is a historical artefact, um, but that is part of Bourne's history. Now, if you, you know, where, where do you stop when you, when you, you know, would you, would you say, would you demolish a, a chapel? Would you demolish... Um, you know, uh, you know, medieval schoolhouse or a stately home, um, or, or, or say a, a you know, medieval footbridge. Would you knock these down? No, you'd put a preservation order on them. Yeah. And so why not this railway bridge? 
I mean, it, it could be made into um, a feature linking the new part of Bourne, which is Elsie Park, yeah. into the traditional part of Bourne. And it would be a permanent reminder, Bourne was a big railway junction. So it, it could become stage. almost like a, a visitor attraction. Well, it could be. It would become a matter of pride. Like um, um, Elsie Park, there is nothing there that is harks back to the past. It is a totally modern uh, development. Yeah. Okay, you, you know, the, there, is a, there is a demand for modern houses. But if you've got something that could be enhanced as a focal point or a, send, you know, a focal feature, then obviously it's a matter of pride for the town. Um, as I mean, Bourne hasn't been brilliant at preserving its history. Like in in, in the Wellhead Park, that you know, if you look hard enough, you'll see undulations in the ground where there was a castle. Yeah. Uh, once now, you know, you have to really struggle to find a sign pointing to the site, or even um, an information board explaining what it's all about. I mean, all we know about history from that time is um, Bourne Town Football Club. They the nicknamed the Wakes after Harry Wood the Wake he used to hang around these parts. Yeah. So, you know, so if you if you take away the town's heritage, you're taking away part of its character. And what what do opponents of the bridge, i.e. the the com- I mean, presumably the company obviously want to the the building companies want to build houses and make money. Um, but what's the stability of the bridge? Is, is it okay? Is it safe? Well, they, uh, the, there was quoted in the local press when I first looked at this, it would cost a million pounds or, or something like that to repair it. Um, yeah. I don't think so. Um, um, you know, looking looking at similar structures in, on, on preserved railways in Britain, I don't think it would even approach that figure. Um, um, you know, it's basically the masonry and block work. You, you, you know, I'm probably, you're probably looking at a five-figure sum more, more like an estimated twenty, thirty thousand pounds. Yeah. You know, to stop bricks falling off. But, you know, I, you know, you, you wouldn't be using the bridge again. It would just be um, an artifact in the middle of a, you know, in that landscaped area. Yeah. Sure. You know, it, it would be a structure in its own right. Well, I'm going to put a picture on on the show notes. Um, if any yeah. any listeners are interested in actually seeing the bridge, we, partic- particularly with the, the artwork on it, do we know who actually um, painted the the painting in it? No, no. Um, I wrote this up in the magazine, so I I called them at the Banksy of Bourne. Yes. I asked people at Bourne History Group who um, who have been campaigning to save it, and they genuinely didn't know who'd done the artwork. But it's obviously it's not just. Um, Bog standard graffiti. Somebody had some skill to do. Oh, very that. much so. Yeah, I noticed that. And also, it it, it covered it, it eradicated some of the more obscene um, traditional forms of graffiti that yeah. were on that side of the bridge. So, what are the chances of of saving the bridge? Do you think? Well, I think the last time I heard that, um, you know, the um, the developers who had applied for planning permission, they'd been granted planning permission to knock it down on condition. They filled certain requirements, and one of those was to complete a wildlife survey. Now, if for argument's sake they found there were bats living there, and uh, there, are, there are bats further along the railway track bed at Toft Hill Tunnel, yeah. um, under the road between Bourne to um, Stamford, um, there, there is a very strong case for saying, well, this is a protected species, the bridge must say. Yeah. And it, it may well be, um, after the local elections, it may well be there might be some new councillors and might have a change of heart. I don't know. Well, it's a very striking structure. I mean, it's a difficult structure to find. It's easy to find if you know how. Yeah. Um, you know, you're basically... You, you just drive into Elsie Park and look for Newton Abbott Way and drive to the very end where it just ends on a grass verge. And there's somebody, I think, from the history group who's very care- helpfully put some way mark signs. And you follow them, and obviously if um, it's been raining, there's a bit of boggy ground to go through. And um, you can see this bridge, this three-arch bridge, um, looming out of the mist and the clouds, you know, almost like a ghost. Um, <laughs> Or something from a Hammer Horror movie, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's wonderfully atmospheric. And you know, when um, a lot of people in Bourne don't even know it's there because um, you know it's it's sealed off. The, the, you know, it's not on any 
you know, well-used footpaths now. You have to really know how to find it. If there's any listeners in Bourne listening to this show, um, I would urge them to uh, take the trip there. We'll put, we'll it's put worth having a look at it. So, yeah. I mean, it's spectacular in its own way. It's a classic Victorian railway bridge, brick, brick, brick built, and, um, you know, it is part of Bourne's heritage. Yeah. People can say, well, look, Bourne had a railway. This is what built Bourne into the town it is now. Yeah. So um, just moving on to railways, your, your interest in railways obviously covers uh, heritage railways and also the, the, the railways in general. And I know that before the lockdown when things were very traffic was really busy it slowed down a bit now but it's starting to come up again before the lockdown we were hearing an awful lot about the resurgence in the railways more passenger traffic why do you yeah. think that is um well basically uh, traveling by train is more convenient um it's quicker more convenient um yeah and often can be cheaper you know to buy a train ticket than buy a tank full of petrol if there's just one person traveling you know, I, I think, you know, I think a lot of towns, um, Birmingham is a particularly bad example, for, for decades been congested at peak periods. And it's just like yeah. absolute misery driving through, through yeah. them. And London is a non-starter. And, you know, this is why suburban rail routes um, really should be taken, making a comeback. And you've, you've also got the environmental considerations as well, the benefits well, yes, um, you know, trains are, you know, are sort of, um, we're going towards electrified railways away from diesel and um, haul trains. We're going in that direction. It, you know, it's far, far better for the environment than, you know, queues of cars um, queuing up behind traffic lights that rarely move and just spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, um, you know, and causing an, an unhealthy, you know, environment for the people who live in the yeah. in, in the area. So you think train trains are the future? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I do. Um, obviously, possibly not in the form we know them now. Um, they probably would be hydrogen fueled, like you know, locomotives, you know, type of things that are being tested out now. Um, with the emphasis on green energy. Yeah. You know, rather than diesel fuel, and um, with electric, would you know, obviously um, power driven from um, maybe solar power or wind power, but that's 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 I think is the future. I don't think we'll ever replace the car because it, you know a train will never um, replace the personal choice no. um, and the convenience and the versatility of the car. Yeah, particularly if you've got multi visits on one day or something. It's, it's yes. quite difficult to do that on a train. So in terms of, the, of the, the new forms of energy for trains, you mentioned hydrogen there. Uh, are any countries yeah. actually using it, or is it still in development phase? It's still in the development phase. Like, um, I know the Bowness and Kinneel Railway, um, just um, to the west of Edinburgh, yeah. there is um, a, a um, diesel train at the moment which is being converted to run on hydrogen power. That's an, ex- an experimental phase. I mean, I wrote a story about that two or three months ago. And um, also at the Severn Valley Railway at um, Kidderminster, one of um, Britain's um, most popular heritage railways, there's um, a um, project um, being carried out in conjunction with Birmingham University to take an old uh, no- diesel shunter from the ni- late 1950s and convert it so it runs on green energy, wow. you know, hi- hydrogen fuel, fuel yeah, cells. Yeah. I know the railway quite well because I um, lived in Kidderminster in the early 90s for yes. about three years and uh, used to go and visit a little place called Arley. Oh, yes, yeah. And we were watching the steam trains come up. So it's a lovely railway, that one. Yeah, It is. It's yeah. a very, very, very good place, yes. In terms of the ownership of railways, obviously there, there are people that would say it should be a national ownership. Some people would say private. What are your thoughts on that? I've got mixed feelings on this. Um, I remember the British Railways, and um, it, 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 you know I was not impressed in the last year. My my experience, uh, you know, of British Railways, you couldn't care less staff. They've got the job, so they're going for the motions. Um, you know, the punctuality wasn't always brilliant. Um, you know, the privatisation, I welcome that because you, you had competition. Sadly, um, uh, it, it hasn't worked in some areas. There is a case for some routes should have been kept in public ownership because they require a subsidy. Yeah. yeah um, 
you know, again, railways come back to the form of green transport, keeping motor sort of traffic off the roads. Yeah. But other other um, routes um, are capable of making a profit. And, you know, privatisation brought in private investment. However, several companies over the years have failed or gone to the wall or, you know, and there's a case of the government has had to come in and bail them out. Yeah. And I wouldn't want the clock to go back to pre-privatisation days. No, certainly not with a not not with the British Rail Sandwich. No, no, no. But that <laughs> that, that, that was that was just um, yeah, you know, the uh, the public image. He wasn't yeah. very good. So um, maybe maybe as you as you've already alluded to, a hybrid version. Yeah, I mean, I think you know what the government seems to be doing is taking control of the actual track that the um, trains are running on and also one or two of the the uh, train operating companies that they've taken into public ownership like LNER which runs from um, London to Edinburgh via Peaceborough and then Newcastle. Yeah. I think that will become part of this new Great British Railway yeah. and there was a need to take that over and um, when the previous company um, didn't uh, do exactly what should have been done but there is still is a case for open access and private operators that can run things efficiently and effectively at no cost to the taxpayer should be allowed to do so. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good thought. So um, talking about your, your journalism and your writing, tell us about your books that you've written over the years. Well, the, the first book I wrote was a history of the uh, my hometown, Sully Hall, um, I brought it out about 25 years ago, just compiled from news cuttings from the 20th century. It was called the Solihull Century. Yeah. Um, and then I think I've, re- I, you know, I've re- you know, been working within railway journalism. I've, I've done, you know, several books on railways as the um, need has arisen, like books on particular lines or areas. Um, I've also done travel books, you know, like, uh, you know, like, I'm particularly fond of the West Country, and I've done books on there, my favourite place of all time, Padstow. And also, I started doing a book on a series of books on lighthouses around the British Isles. Right. Yeah, um, so, um, yeah, I've done quite a wide, wide, wide range of books. I, I think I've done a couple of children's books on railways as well. Yeah. So, rivaling Thomas the Tank, eh? No, no, no. It's just uh, explaining you know, the railway concept to children in yeah. very simple terms yeah. and things. I've so. you know, done one or two things like that. Um, I've got a, a, you know, the next book, I think, you know, at the, um, um, at the publishing stage at the moment is um, a history of Mallard, you know, the, um, lo- the locomotive that became the fastest in the world in 1938. Um, yes, I've heard of that. Yeah. You know, when it did 126 mile an hour through. Um, up Stoke Bank, or down Stoke Bank, rather, in Lincolnshire, which is my adopted home county. Yeah. Are these books all available for people to buy still? I think they are. I think they're all in print. Um, yeah, yeah. I think just do a Google search on the internet. I think um, they're, um, the, you know, most of them are... I, I haven't heard of any going out. No, well, what, what we'll do, I mean, we'll, we'll put, put some links on for, for anybody who's interested in having a look at your books, I think, Robin. We'll put those okay. on, on the show notes as well. And in terms of the, the magazine that you're the editor of, can you tell us a bit about that Heritage Railway magazine, please? Yeah, it was founded 22 years ago. I can't believe so much time has gone by. Um, there was a publisher in Stamford approached me and, you know, wanted to do a magazine that um, covered, you know, steam, diesel and electric traction but with an accent on... Um, you know, the, the, pres- the preservation scene and, you yeah. know, what's the now known as Heritage Railways. Yeah. But obviously looking back to people and nostalgic about steam in the 50s and 60s and then some of the earlier diesels in the um, 60s and 70s and as represented in the heritage sector. So um, I launched it and um, I thought as well, well, you know, it might only last six or seven months. Well, I'm looking for something else. But actually, um, it took off and it's, it's been there ever since. It's done very well. And this is, this is still available in hard copy, is it, rather than just digital? Oh, Heritage Railway, yes. You know, yeah. going, to, you know going to any shops, many of the supermarkets, you know, you, you can buy it. Oh, you know, right. It comes out every 28 days. Yeah. Well, again, we'll put a link to that on on the show notes. So you've done quite a lot with your journalism and your interest in railways. What are you most proud of? 
I don't know, the one thing I get the most satisfaction out of, um, I suppose, obviously seeing Heritage Railways sort of gone to issue 280, and, um, you know, obviously it's an achievement, but um, many people have launched railway magazines over the years, but not all that many have succeeded, and I'm still there. Yeah. And it gives me a, a basis on which I can do other projects from as well. Oh, that's great, isn't it? And and do um, do you sell any of the magazines overseas? Oh, yes. Like most countries, you know, Taiwan, you know, Australia, yeah. America. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite widely distributed. Oh, that's fantastic. So if there's anybody listening who's thinking of becoming an, an investigative journalist or an editor of a magazine, for that matter, what sort of advice would you give them? I would say think very carefully about it because the internet, I think, by and large, has killed the journalism off that I grew up with and was trained in. Um, basically, uh, yeah, where, where, when, there were, when the, the ownership of computers became widespread, many newspapers attempted to go and put all their news online free of charge, yeah. which um, they thought would in- encourage more advertisers and more people to buy the paper. No, it isn't. People thought, well, actually, I've got a PC, I've got a laptop, I can read all the news free of charge. Why yeah. should I go to the shop and buy a paper? And I think this has happened everywhere. Papers were selling maybe um, a quarter of a million copies a night are now down to selling 10,000 in some cases. Mm. Uh, and, you know, when I, when I was a trainee journalist back in the very early 80s, you'd go for a, a couple of weeks' work experience at a typical weekly paper and you'd see a newsroom with, say, an editor, a deputy editor, and and probably about eight or nine or even ten journalists working on a weekly title, and a photographer, you know, or two photographers. Now, um, the same news, you know, if you, if it was still running, you'd probably find an editor, um, and possibly for, if they were lucky to have an assistant, both going now taking pictures on mobile telephones or compact cameras when they have to, and, um, you know, working all the hours God sends to put them out. So... Yeah. Um, it's, um, I feel sad about it because when you actually cut down on the resources because you haven't got the, um, the, the financial backing to put out weekly newspapers and evening newspapers to the same extent, you're not covering the whole spectrum of the society which it covers. Like, you might decide not to go and cover magistrates or crown courts, and though, you know, which um, are part and parcel of what's going on in you know the town around you and yeah. you know you, you 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 end up just having um, weekly papers such as just picture specials and which tell, which tells you very little that you can't just get from you know a local council report of planning applications or occasionally one one or two big council meetings once a month and i think it's very sad i think we've all lost out and but i would say if you want to go into journalism um you know you know you know the newspapers will give you a good training in it but look at doing public relations or you know something else that is a bit more rewarding because you know in newspaper the newspaper sector uh, unless you get a, a top job on one of the nationals i wouldn't say you know it's something you're going to um you know want to want to be with for the rest of your life on the uh, basic basic salary that, that's i think that's a good sort of conclusion it, it obviously with the internet things have changed dramatically so it's a different type of career choice now is, is oh, yes. my understanding and but there are still things you could do in pr etc which would actually enable you to use some of your your writing talents yeah yeah pr marketing good areas uh, you know and um you know, um, you know, if you, if you've got a niche, you know, you can do things on a freelance basis. But again, I don't. You know, that's very. Um, you really don't know where your next payment's coming from. Yeah. You know, you could work freelance for a newspaper, and then suddenly they have a, a drop in advertising. They're told to cut the editorial budget. Right, let's cut a couple of freelancers out. Yeah. And something you've relied on as an income for two years suddenly is gone. Yeah. So um, it's something, I know lots of people enter journalism, they do it for the love of writing or, you know, but they really ought to think a lot harder about it, I think. No, I think that's that's good advice, Robin. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you what you did in your spare time, but it, it look, sounds to me as though you're very busy. <laughs> Is there anything else you do? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do um, a little magazine, um, a uh, fan magazine for a reasonably well-known rock band. You know, an, uh, they're well an English fan magazine. Yeah. I'll do that occasionally, but I'm a bit behind on that at the moment because I've been snowed under with my day job, which has to come first. Of course. And who, can, we, can we ask who the band is? Yeah, it's a um, band from um, Hawthorne, California called The Beach Boys. The Beach Boys? You know, very big in the 60s. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, there's um still very popular. Uh, you know, yeah, they're still very popular. Yeah, yeah. but um, obviously their 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 concerts, is, you know, for, they're going to hold a couple of concerts next month. Has been cancelled, obviously, because of yeah. travel problems, and um, so that's been put off to next year. But I'm still working to get the next edition of the magazine out. But that's a hobby, really. Yeah. It's um, yeah. yeah. So where can people find out more about your work, Robin? Well, really, Heritage Railway magazine, going to Smith's, going to a, new, a news agent, order a copy um, from the publisher in Horncastle, or, um, or you know, we've, we've got a Facebook page, um, you know, got a, we've got websites. Um, or, you know, if you want, you want to look at the books, I think you just do a Google search under the name Robin Jones author and you'll... You, you, you know, they will come up. All of which we'll put on the show notes. That That's great. So it's been great yeah. talking to you, Robin. Thanks ever so much for coming on the show. OK. Well, yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be of assistance. Thank you. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.